so much, uh, Mike. I'll um, just start by uh, saying something about you listening to me. Uh, I see, I saw this event was framed in part what we can learn from uh, Norway in the context of Scotland. So I'm going to presuppose that uh, by having that question, you are not asking that on behalf of the Scottish oil industry nor of the British government, and that uh, that you're not seeking the lessons from the Norwegian government to the British government, from the, uh, the, Nor the British one. If that were the case, I would have given a completely different uh, talk today. Uh, and my talk would have been concentrated around how is it possible for a country like Norway to even in the midst of the pandemic uh, uh, prioritize very much um, investments and tax breaks for the oil industry while talking about a green shift. In fact, the week that is coming up in Norway now is going to be the launch of the climate part of the kind of crisis funds that has been awarded by the Norwegian government. But just three weeks ago, they already made the plans for the oil industry responding to a demand by the oil industry to have a tax break so that they could keep up the level of investments even with the oil price being uh, uh, at the bottom. So, but the Norwegian government has been really, really good uh, at trying to portray even continued investment in oil and gas in the North Sea as part and parcel of um, the climate solution in its own uh, right. I, I was, I'm, I'm happy to take more questions about that later on, but I presume that we're talking here today mostly about the lessons that can be drawn and the discussions that we can have from movement to movement, if you like, from, from those of us who try to find ways of solving the climate crisis and seeing the urgency of solving the climate crisis even more on the horizon with the pandemic uh, COVID-19 crisis, and to have a just transition away from more investments in oil and gas and try and put forward an alternative that can be uh, credible and that win support in time in order to shift things in the right direction. There's a, as I'm sure you know, uh, it's the same in Scotland here, a lot of discussion about the restart of the economy, the restart of employment needing to take us away from the old normal towards something better. But there's a big question mark whether that debate actually leads any big change. I saw both Naomi Klein and Greta Thunberg tweet just three days ago mentioning how new coal power plants are being opened in Sweden, in Germany, and elsewhere, and basically talking about the recovery suicide. Uh, so so it's, it's that tension, I guess, that is part of the question of this talk as well. Is it easier or is it harder, in fact, to argue for some sort of climate jobs alternative to continued exploration of fossil fuels? Now, just a few words about myself, so you know. Um, I'm a chair of Concerned Scientist Norway, uh, but in this talk, I'll first and foremost be uh, kind of representative of the Bridge to the Future Alliance, uh, uh, an alliance that was formed in 2014 on the back of a, of a book that I wrote that year called 100,000 Climate Jobs uh, Now, and I'll, I'll go back to that history a little bit later on. Um, I should also mention that I, I give these talks as some sort of bridge builder, uh, a bridge builder within a fairly big alliance. Most of the environmental movement in Norway is part of the bridge to the future. Uh, quite a few trade unions are part of the, uh, the, the alliance, and the Norwegian church is part of the uh, alliance as well. Uh, so it's a very broad alliance, and I don't speak on behalf of everybody, of course, but I do speak as a bridge builder and as somebody who tries to push that alliance as much as I can. In fact, just before the pandemic 19 crisis struck, I gave a talk at our yearly conference at the trade union headquarters of Oslo. We attended by 500 people and I spoke about how we can strengthen the mobilization for uh, climate jobs in Norway. So I really feel that in the last few months, this has been <laughs> what I've been trying to do to push our alliance into being even more relevant in this uh, day of COVID-19. Uh, okay, the final thing I th thought I should say about myself, I, I am a researcher, I work at a, 
at the Oslo Metropolitan University and just finishing actually today a chapter uh, on climate jobs and the climate job strategy for a handbook of environmental labor studies that comes out next year. So I'll make a plug for that. And the title, uh, I think, says quite a lot about uh, my approach as well in my talk. The title is The Climate Jobs Plan, A Mobilizing Strategy in Search of Agency. And I think it's important to underline all, all the aspects of that title and cover it briefly. First of all, in Norway, we have a climate jobs plan. Uh, that climate jobs, I'll go back to the history of it, but uh, that climate jobs plan has a climate component of it. It addresses a climate need and it addresses a jobs need, a, a need to create new jobs. But it has always been framed also as a way of making concrete a just transition. So a climate jobs plan, and this is not unique for Norway, this is the case in the UK, in Portugal, in, in Canada, in New York State, in South Africa, where there are fairly vibrant climate jobs plans, there are also attempts to pin this climate jobs plan specifically uh, as a way of having a just transition away from fossil fuels. So although you will know the climate jobs argument, but it's always and in every context framed within this idea of just transition away from uh, uh, fossil fuels. Before I elaborate on, on this, just let me give uh, the, a brief kind of history of the Bridge to the Future uh, uh, Alliance. I was present in Durban, South Africa. I was there as a researcher monitoring the media coverage of that climate summit in 2011. And I attended the launch of the South African One Million Climate Jobs Campaign. And for me, what struck me back then was the very notion of the bridge to the future. Uh, uh, I remember so vividly seeing people, workers fighting against water privatization. It's a big scarcity of water in South Africa, as you probably know. And uh, to see people fighting in the here and now for jobs and the access to immediate need like water and for a public water system in South Africa, while simultaneously fighting for jobs that were about solving the climate. I mean, I knew about the notion before I, <laughs> before I came there, but to see to see that struggle kind of manifest itself was to me an enduring inspiration and it, and it, it, it um, kind of prompted me to just knock on doors back in Norway, knock on the trade union doors and the environmentalist doors, knock on other scientists doors and eventually also uh, come into contact with, uh, with, with, with the Norwegian church and, and, and the church societies which is also part of the climate movement uh, in Norway. So uh, the first book was published in 2013. Interestingly, the, the, uh, uh, this is part of an hit, uh, old history, but it's kind of interesting in terms of alliance building, because when I launched the book back in 2013, I was kind of accompanied by trade union leaders uh, of Norway, and they were kind of part and parcel of the launch. But at the same time, the Norwegian church had its church council, and they had just made a, a, count, uh, um, a statement arguing for a moratorium on uh, oil exploration in North uh, Sea, and basically making a moral argument against Norway as the rich country as it is, uh, 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 understanding the, the climate science needs to scale down its oil. So that was that meeting between the unions, who most and unions are mostly there for jobs. They're mostly there to fight for jobs. That's their primary task. And that was what they were most vocal about when we launched the campaign. But as we launched it together with the church and the environmental movement, that also made the arg argument for having a controlled break on continued Norwich, Norwegian oil and gas exploration part of the argument. So if you go to the web page afterwards, you can do that. There's an English page on Bridge to the Future, and you'll see the kind of slogan for our campaign and for our, 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 our yearly conference is uh, 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 100,000 climate jobs to put a break on Norwegian oil exploration. In other words, the climate jobs plan 
is part and parcel of the just transition uh, strategy. Uh, because you cannot, you cannot expect oil workers, and particularly in a country like Norway, oil workers have, they have fought for their rights, they have fought for their salaries, they have fought vehemently in the, in, in the 80s for safety pr protocols and so on that are among the best in the world. And in many cases, they've also uh, uh, fought to make, uh, to make the oil sector as clean as possible. I mean, I, I speak with oil workers. I don't go to my oil rigs myself, but but the way they describe it, you know, as really, really clean entities. You know, they, they, there, there's no recycling issues whatsoever. Uh, there was never any flaring on the Norwegian uh, oil platforms uh, and, and, and so on. It's, it, it's a history where Norwegian oil workers as part of a national state oil industry has been considered in many ways the heroes of the welfare state, you know, uh, bringing a lot of revenue to make sure that we have a welfare system that can cope with uh, the COVID-19 crisis and so on. So it's tremendously important that when we frame solutions for climate change, we do that with the utmost respect for these group of workers. But as we argue for the climate jobs, at the same time, we need to realize that even with the support of other unions and the church and so on, we are only we only have this very very good idea of climate jobs. We do not offer the paycheck. We do not uh, uh, offer the job security in the here uh, and now. So that's why this part of building up agency, building up strength, making climate jobs not just a good idea, but as something that kind of becomes a reality. That's such an urgent question for us. Um, but I mean, I, I was in 2017, I gave quite a lot of speeches on climate jobs every year, different uh, union venues, other places. In 2000, I've been twice to the Western part of Norway where most of the oil industry is focused. 2017, I went to this um, regional trade union conference called the Rugalon uh, Konferansen. This was just in the aftermath of the last oil crisis of the 2015 with a drop in the oil price which uh, which which made the Norwegian employment rate go quite a bit up and I argued very very strongly uh, like you know like the, like I'm doing just now you know saying that I understand that oil workers uh, um, you know for them the words and the good idea of climate jobs is not enough you know it's 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 uh, it's not a plan it's not it's not real employment it's not job security uh, after the 2015 uh, uh, oil price, a uh, uh, lot of people in the western part of Norway went unemployed, and they they had to work part-time work and so on. You know, so it's really important for the climate jobs to to be good jobs, to be unionized jobs, to be jobs that are attractive and so on. So, um, but I could still get this conference for, uh, to to support the call. For 100,000 climate jobs, and and that that was a conference consisting of many people working not just in the oil industry itself, but also in the kind of adjacent, um, what's it called, maritime sector. You know, people who who can both produce uh, uh, oil platforms, but also can convert their their skills to produce offshore windmills. Uh, so 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 basically. As the investments in oil is, is going back, the opportunity of using those same skills for jobs in offshore wind comes to the fore. And um, indeed, that was part of the 50,000 on the 100,000 climate jobs I first argued in, in 2013 were, were precisely jobs within offshore wind. That's one of the um, main avenues where we could shift uh, work from oil and gas to renewable. Uh, energy. Uh, okay. So, uh, the last minutes I'll just use on that main question: easier or harder now? <laughs> and uh, I th as I think I suggested in the uh, to begin with, it's kind of both. It's kind of both in the sense that uh, there's all this talk about. The restarting the economy on a green path. And it was interesting to note that even the finance department of the, the current government 
were a bit skeptical about the industry's demand for a tax break for oil. Why? Because even from um, an economic point of view, uh, continued large investments in the North Sea and the Barents Sea might be a losing investment. The, if they get that tax uh, uh, break or, or that tax postponement, which is really on the cards, we cannot be sure to get that money back because we cannot really be sure whether that, those investments in the Barents Sea will ever be profitable. And this, this was a hesitation that even the finance department of the current conservative government had. So the oil industry didn't really get all they wanted uh, uh, b- because of that. So, so, so that's an illustration on the one hand how, how open the field is to argue for something different, to argue for a different path of Norway, to argue for climate jobs. And this might sound like a small thing, but to me to have, you know, uh, organizations within the Bridge to the Future Alliance, there are environmental organizations, there are unions. When they all, re- they, all they go to meetings with the government, they go to, they talk to the media and, 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 you know, like friends of the earth in Norway, they will now talk about climate jobs in those meetings with the government, which I think is a, is a good thing. Although we've already, they've always been part of the alliance. The fact that they're pushing for it a bit more actively now is really, really good. And, and as you, some of you may know, there's a kind of global call now for climate jobs called Climate Jobs, an idea whose time has come. And I've, last week I started to get uh, to, to phone up some union leaders even outside the Bridge to the Future Alliance and got some prominent union leaders to, set, to sign up on that uh, um, demand. So I think that there's a feeling, there's a feeling that climate jobs is moving from being just being this kind of good idea, but not quite realizable idea, if you know what I mean. Kind of, kind of like socialism used to be called in the old days. You know, it's a good idea, but it will never work in practice. The climate jobs, I think, has suffered a bit of the same fate in the sense of, oh, it sounds good, but can we really do it? You know, and now I think there's the feeling that we have to do it, we can do it. But at the same time, that feeling, which is really, really spread out. I mean, there was a poll in Norway saying that one third of the population wants the government to be as as proactive fighting climate change as they have been fighting the corona. So there's a sense that the, the state needs to push. We have to do things. We have to do things even if the short-term profit isn't big. So there's, there's a feeling that the relevance and the real thinginess of climate jobs is more there. At the same time, those with most power <laughs> move things and they continue to move things and they demand with more force than the movement does so far. So my sense of things that it's, it's, it's kind of getting easier to getting the climate jobs argument out there and maybe we may be winning the argument, but we're not actually winning the war. We're not winning uh, 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 the big money for the climate jobs, for offshore wind, for collective transport, for retrofitting houses, the big three of, 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 of climate jobs. We're not winning. But my hope is that by getting the voice out louder now, then we will start to win uh, 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 eventually. So, so that's my, my, um, my rough assessment of the easier and harder. I think I've spoken for 20 minutes, which is uh, enough. And I look forward to having uh, more of a conversation with you. Uh, now. Thanks.